Hello, I'm Lux. And Ember. And this is another one of our 10 things random order personal opinion don't kill us lists. This time we are looking at 10 shows that we think should be remade. These are shows that were either good for their time or had a lot of potential. And there's just so much that could be done with the concepts. Number one, Cubics, Robots for Everyone. Now, just looking at the basic show, it's painful. Bad puns, stereotypes, mediocre computer animation. But when you get down to the core story, you have robots that are driven by emotion. So they are human-like. They can disobey. They do not have the Asimov's three laws to protect humans. You have a boy whose father hates robots, a boy who loves robots, and manages to reactivate the mysterious robot Cubix. Change a few names around, and this could also be known as Mega Man Zero. <laughs> yeah, with some other changes like it's a post-apocalyptic world and so on and so forth. Also, if you want to watch this show, it's on Hulu, so you can get a gist of what we think needs to be updated about it and remade. It was um, part of uh, CW's Vortex, um, but my station stopped the Vortex broadcast a couple weeks ago, so don't know if anyone else is still getting Vortex lineup. Number two, Get Ed. Oh, I really liked this show when it was on. There was a lot of good action in it, and the premise was good. And the writing was pretty good, but there was a lot left out, and the ending just kind of stopped. We got to this point where the main villain finally got what he kind of wanted, and he started to do things, and it was left at a cliffhanger. I'm not sure if that was cell shading or low-grade computer animation, but the animation would definitely benefit from an update as well. Yeah, it was a complete CG show. So yeah, with modern stuff, it would look a whole lot better. I mean, look at what they're doing with the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series. That's really well done, and it will just get better over time. Yeah, but, you know, the cast members were so quirky, you know, and the whole dynamic of having a courier service. Mm-hmm, and the slowly leaking over time backstory of what exactly Ed is. Mm-hmm. Number three, Dragon Booster. All right, I know this is one that has a pretty strong following because people were hoping for the sequel series Dragon Booster Academy. It was... Enjoyable at points and painful at points to me. The animation, I've heard it said it was cell shaded. Animation could definitely use an update. We could use some better progression from, oh yes, Dragon Racing, Dragon of Legend, and the whole Arthur and Knights of the Round Table, you know, where we're trying to get all the different boosters together. You know, because we have the Dragon Booster, the Shadow Booster, I don't remember the name of the booster that Parmenshan was supposed to be. Well, I didn't really watch much of this, but the parts I did, I kind of liked. And I really wish I would have saw more of it, but I can see the points that you brought up from the points that you described and how they would update it. And it was another completely CG show in the shell saying style, which can be easily updated to still have that cartoony-like style, but still look a whole lot better. Example again, the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles show. Yeah. I think one of the main things that got me with Dragon Booster was the magnetics and how different dragons use certain colors. Wouldn't it kind of be a giveaway that Bo, as a racing dragon, is red and blue, but uses an odd variety of mag equipment? And there's no other dragon that's physically designed like him in most of the races. So why isn't anyone going, hey, the Dragon of Legend of the Dragon Booster and Arthur Penn's Racing Dragon are the exact same build? Can't be that hard to die a dragon. Uh, plot holes. They could always be fixed in a remake or reboot. Yes, but since remake is our topic, bringing up reasons why. Number four, American Dragon, Jake Long. I watched this series on and off. I like certain concepts of it. And it kind of helps the series that it was voiced by the same guy who voiced Zuko. So, yeah, that helps a lot. But I couldn't really get into it. And they actually changed the animation style, like, for the second or third season. I can't remember which. Which kind of also turns me off because they were trying to make things quicker. 
Yeah, well, it seemed actually like a trade-off because the animation to me in the earlier episodes was better, but the story progression in the later episodes to me was actually better. So it was like they fired all the animators and hired more writers. I remember it was kind of spin like that. They wanted the writers to have more freedom. Yeah, but the basic concept of a humanoid who is actually a dragon and is charged with the protection of the various magical creatures of the land. So come on, who doesn't want to be a dragon? And there's that whole, you slap a dragon on the cover and everyone will buy it, even if it's not very good. <laughs> but in this case, it has potential. Yeah. So you have the potential of, you know, the normal trope of a kid who just wants to be normal and hang out with his friends, finding out that he has all this responsibility and finding a balance of how to do it on his terms. Finding out that the girl that he totally has a crush on is actually a dragon hunter. Whoops. That kind of put a kinks in your plans. <laughs> yeah. Finding out that she had a twin sister. Changing the entire timeline to save her and actually removing her from your life and giving her a better life. That's sacrifice. What teenager has that kind of potential outside of an anime? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently I needed to watch more of this show because you just pointed out like, that's an interesting time travel or something. That's kind of cool. <laughs> well, there, there was several time travel. And also you have him being shown up by his younger sister. She's smarter. She's also a dragon. And she tends to take that, that she's better than him academically, that she's a better magical guardian than him, which leads to some issues as well. Number five, He-Man and She-Ra. Since one's a spinoff of the other, we're sharing a slot here. But there is definitely room for remakes of both of these series, though they were very similar with one designed to specifically go after the male demographic and one after the female, I think there's enough differences between the two universes to justify bringing back both. And we do know about the other remake that was done uh, a couple of years ago for He-Man. Yeah. Though I'm wondering, is it worthwhile to keep them as siblings and twins? Because that was mainly a reason to have He-Man go looking for She-Ra and gave us the inception for the spinoff. Logically, it doesn't make any sense for Hordak to come in, steal one royal child on a planet that he's not even trying to conquer, and raise it as a guard in his forces on the planet that he's almost completely conquered. But they both characters have different dynamics of how they cope with being a hero. You know, Prince Adam deliberately dumbs himself down so that no one can draw a connection between his incompetence and He-Man's skill. Now, there's a whole level that's not really explored there of, does he ever get tired of playing the dunce? You know, he gets no respect for being the person that he is. He's always putting on an act. And then with She-Ra, I think she got it a little better because both as Adora of the Rebel Fighters and She-Ra, Princess of Power, she is a highly intelligent, capable person. And that could be written really well nowadays with all these really good writers who are writing very strong female characters. Yeah. You know, She-Ra was a very strong female character for her time. And she could definitely use an update. And besides, who doesn't want a magic sword that turns into anything, a winged unicorn to ride, the ability to heal and talk to animals? She's got a pretty good list of superpowers going. And speaking of female characters that need an update... <laughs> Number six, Rainbow Bright. Oh my. There was apparently like an online update that Hallmark, I think it was Hallmark who owns the rights to her, tried to do. Unfortunately. Don't go looking for it. Don't. Don't. Don't, for the love of God, don't. <laughs> someone needs to grab the rights from Hallmark. I don't know, maybe Hasbro or someone, and at least for the animated series, and make a new one that, oh, I don't know, is good. Because <laughs> the first one was good and it had potential, but yeah, it would be awesome to have an update nowadays. Yeah, well, you know, the series pilot went very dark and in-depth, but then the series as a whole turned into the mild, tragedy, incompetent villain of the week fodder, <laughs> when there's really potential for so much more. Speaking of incompetent villains, I really like those two incompetent villains. 
<laughs> Murky and Lurky, they were fun. And I'm not saying we can't have fun, incompetent villains. Team Rocket, cough. <laughs> Team Rocket's blasting off again! There's just so many places that that can be taken, you know, with color being taken from the world, happiness being taken, you know, it really has the potential to focus on some uplifting, positive messages. Yeah, there's lots of potential there for a lot of good writing and a lot of creative stuff to go on because, you know, you've, you've got all the color kids and you can have all these different personalities interacting with each other. And have real personalities, not just the cookie cutter ones that we had for Red Butler and Lala Orange and everyone. I mean, you have this whole cast of characters to work with and you can create some really creative stuff. Number seven, Dino Saucers. Oh my god, this show was awesome when it was on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we met some new friends from out of town. <laughs> I just wanted to be remade so I can watch it again and have an excuse to go out and buy it. If it isn't out on DVD, it should be. <laughs> Incredibly fun. And the updates that we could have to the character designs with all the additional scientific research that has occurred since Dinosaurs came out. And the new discovery of other dinosaurs, like I believe it's Spinodon, which is this one with this big fin on its back. Kind of looks like a platypus in a way. Because it has a long mm -hmm. beak-like snout. There's just so much potential there with just a lot of cool things. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you still want to keep the kids in, you know. And maybe we could have a better explanation for why creatures that have claws have these rings that fit human hands. There may have been a good explanation in the original. I don't remember it right now if it was there. But... You know, I want one of those rings. I want to be able to turn it on and suddenly have gymnast abilities. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. And how much more could be done with that with the popularity of free running parkour? You could get some pretty awesome action scenes in there for the humans. And with the stuff we can do with animation now, even with 2D animation, I mean, look at the stuff they're doing with My Little Pony. <laughs> That's on Flash. It's scary. <laughs> and. Maybe dial down the campiness just a little bit. Don't really need the dinosaurs versus the Tranodons in a court of law. They're all <laughs> levels of wrong with that episode. I don't remember the episode at all. I need to track down this stuff. <laughs> Number eight, Jim and the Holograms. This show severely needs an update because it was basically very very stereotypical if you look at it and it didn't really make much sense but the concept of a band on stage that uses holograms and they're also superheroes that uses holograms is a good concept and especially nowadays with the vocaloids basically being Jim in the holograms you could even integrate them into a show with an episode where they go over to Japan yeah you could completely change the concept you no longer have to have Jerrica standing in for Jim and have the image going over. You could actually have Jim of Jim and the Holograms be a wholly synthetic creation. And that's the secret, not the dual identity, but the actual secret of Jim basically being Miku Hatsune. <laughs> that's a concept I didn't think of, but it's a nice concept. You always think of good ones. <laughs> I try. And the thing with a program like this, I think it would be a fantastic outlet for people to submit their music to because both Jim and the Holograms and the Misfits had a song in nearly every episode but you know actually make Jim and the Holograms a real band like Miku or any of the other Vocaloids have people submit songs to the show sell digital albums don't make it just a show make it a format for getting music out there mm, Wow. That's a really good concept. <laughs> you listening, uh. Warner Brothers? <laughs> oh. I know you have the license for this. I thought it was Hasbro, because Hasbro's been showing it on the Discovery um, Family Channel now, as it's known. Warner Brothers did the DVD release. Hasbro, uh. if you bought it, thank you. Please remake. <laughs> uh, yes, Warner Brothers, the bane of some of our hopes and dreams. Why didn't this sell well? Well, you because you released a, a, a cruddy release. That's why. <laughs> Moving on. 
Number 9, Code Lyoko. This show has so much potential, and it started out as a Monster of the Week show. But it had these constants in it where you're like, I want to know more! Why does it travel back in time? How does it travel back in time? Why can't you save people if they die? What? I mean, and then you can, and then there's this, and oh my god! <laughs> Now, why is Xana doing this? Why is the girl trapped in the computer? You know, how did you truly ever discover the machine? Why is it just a handful of kids taking care of this? Because this ha I understand a handful of kids discovering it and figuring out how it works. Never occurs to anyone to bring a competent adult into the situation. I don't know, considering how dangerous the world is, maybe a martial arts expert? <laughs> Detective? Master computer programmer? Something like that. Uh, yeah, and I managed to finally watch the two episodes they did as a special where it explained some of this, but still I was like, um, did they just offhandedly say that, oh, the time travel thing is a off, uh, basically just, they off to the side mention that, oh, yeah, we can travel back in time. Oh, okay, and you have to do it manually. Uh, okay. No, because she has to get to the tower, type in the code Lyoko, and then Jeremy has to hit the button, return to the past now. Yeah, but sometimes it does it without him actually doing anything, so I'm trying to figure out what's going on. In my opinion, if they did a remake, the code Lyoko should be a sequencer where, like, okay, it does the code that stops Xana. We know that by default, but it also triggers the code that does it the back in time. But you can also trigger the code that goes back in time manually so we can have some episodes where they just use the back in time thing to fix mistakes that they did without having to um, do a whole Xana thing, so you could have some variety in the episodes. Yeah, but we did have an episode where Return to the Past was used casually when uh, the boy did it to get a lottery ticket to give to Yumi's parents because they were having financial issues. Wow, I don't remember the episode and I haven't caught up on that yet. <laughs> yeah, and they end up scolding him because you can't just use Return to the Past casually. Every time you use Return to the Past, Xana gets stronger. Okay, how does that work? That every time we reset things, Xana gets stronger? The only thing I can think of is Xana, just like anyone who's ever been to Lyoko, retains everything that happened. So every time they go to the past, he gets to the day to learn more. Well, I understand getting more cunning, but they actually say he gets more powerful. Yeah, which they didn't explain up to that point, apparently. <laughs> just one of those things that we'd like to see addressed in a reboot. And speaking of reboots, number 10. Reboot. This was an awesome show for its time. I think it was actually one of the first long-running CG animated cartoon shows for kids. It just has lots of great concepts. The animation was really good for its time, though it looks really dated now. <laughs> and the whole concept of this cyber world where things actually happen completely differently than we think and we interact with it, it's kind of like... What would happen if you took Tron, made it for kids with interesting characters, and turned it into a TV show? <laughs> yeah, it was the only TV show that could actually make you feel bad for playing video games. <laughs> Though I never felt that bad because I mostly played console games, not computer games. So I wasn't just randomly dumping game data into a machine that was just going about minding its own business and then suddenly, warning, incoming game. <laughs> And there's just so much they could do to update the concept. Uh, for one, use better CG animation, but there's like so much more stuff going on nowadays. They could actually talk more about viruses, more about stuff coming from actually quote unquote other countries and different types of games, different types of hardware. Like they could even talk about the new connected devices we have now where you, your toaster is basically connected to the internet so it can tell you when your toast is done kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was a little concerned that, you know, with technology updating so fast that, you know, it was a remake of this actually viable with production time. But if you look back at the original reboot, a lot of the terminology is still the same. Okay, nobody knows what a dot matrix printer is anymore, but a lot of the overarching concepts are the same. And that's the whole point. If you use good general terms that are very prevalent nowadays, that are base phrases like megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, stuff like that, you can easily write the show and keep it up to date. It actually had really good voice acting for its day too, and I hope that continues if they ever do do a reboot, because it's been rumored for years that apparently someone's been working on it, but nothing ever comes to fruition. Well, we can only hope.
Would you like to see these shows be remade? Do you have a childhood favorite or unfavorite that you would like to see remade? Tell us about it in the comments. Please be nice, because these are just our opinions. The numbers are to just help us keep track of where we are. We're not ranking anything. Please don't hurt us. If you liked my art, please consider watching me on DeviantArt or following me on Tumblr. If you want to keep up to date with our videos, please follow us on Tumblr. Links in the description. Oh, and if you really do like my artwork a lot, or enough that you want something of your own, please consider giving me a commission. Link also in the description. Thank you for listening, and hope to speak with you soon.